Welcome to another episode of Lessons in Angular, where we talk about trending topics in the industry and share best practices in Angular. I'm Anthony Jones, and my guest is Hudson Baker. We're both developers here at Brebug. So when it comes to testing our applications, I know there's integration testing, end-to-end -end testing, but you're specifically going to be talking to us about unit testing, right? Yeah, and more so about unit testing in the context of dummies, fakes, stubs, and mocks. A lot of people wrap them in the umbrella of all being considered mocks when they're actually different tools. Why in the world do you want to talk about unit testing? Well, I just have a passion for making things easier on other people. I know unit testing can definitely be a pain point for a lot of people. Um, and historically, there's just a lot of ambiguity surrounding the topic. We're going to be diving into some unit testings within the framework of Jest. And a lot of concepts that we'll be going over will be applicable to any sort of unit testing. A lot of people think of mocks as this big umbrella that covers several topics. And I think that creates a lot of confusion. We see that a lot with enterprise developers that they think mocks are this big umbrella. Um, that's a general term that can be used in any sort of unit test. And I think you can clear that up a lot when we break down these terms into mocks, stubs, dummies and fakes. And when we define those, you can actually figure out where they're applicable in unit tests instead of uh, trying to figure out where this broad term fits in inside mm -hmm. your unit test. Yeah. So before we jump right into it, is there anything the audience should know or have experience with? Yeah, I definitely think people should understand the anatomy of a test bed and how to build one themselves and some basic knowledge of unit testing, um, be it how to set it up or having run basic unit tests themselves. We'll go through and we'll define each term. Um, we'll show how to identify it uh, in your method and then figure out how to implement it in your testing block. And then we'll be able to reach for those tools uh, whenever we see that scenario. Why is it important to know these terms? I think it's important to know these because with unit testing, knowledge is definitely half the battle. Um, when you get into unit testing, you want to know which tool you need to use so that you can reach for it and implement it in a streamlined fashion. Do you have any code that we can look at? Yeah, let's start with some dummies. Um, a dummy is an object that's passed as a parameter but doesn't really do anything. It's usually created to fill a requirement of a function or a class, uh, but has no functional piece of the test. Mm -hmm. So here we can look at this method, update groceries. Mm -hmm. um, it gets the cart total items, the total price, and then it accumulates those things, and then it fetches the discounts with your cart full of groceries. Mm -hmm. Um, fetch discounts is a side effect of our function. It doesn't need to be in this test and it doesn't directly affect how our function runs, but it's a dependency. So to fill that parameter, we need to supply a dummy. When we go over to the unit test, we can describe update groceries and we can just create this dummy function that takes in groceries and returns an object. It has zero functionality, but it just makes sure that it fulfills the parameter of our function. So how can this increase the value of my unit tests? Well, unit testing is all about trimming the fat to assert the responsibility of a function. When you put the side effects behind a veil of a mock or a stub, you trim everything off so that you can look at the core value of the function, which is where unit testing really shines. Now let's talk about stubs. A stub is actually a type of mock, but it's a working implementation of the API that returns some sort of pre-canned value. So for example, when you're testing a method on a service, you don't want to actually include the entire service and the method and utilize it all. You just want that service to be called and return a value that you already know exists. This is where you would stub out a service. So here we have a get delivery date method. Mm -hmm. We see that after it's verified the cart and it makes sure it has more than zero items in it, it calls my service .get delivery date. We don't actually want to include my service in this unit test because it's a lot of overhead and we aren't really testing my service. We're mm -hmm. trying to test get delivery date. Yeah. So we would use a stub to return a pre-canned value any date we want. So when we go to our unit test, we can describe get delivery date. We create a random date with date.now and we use a Jest function with a mock return value of that date. That just means every time my service gets called with get delivery date, it's going to return that exact same value. Then we can assert that our test is getting a delivery date, no matter what that date is. So is this kind of knowledge useful for new and seasoned developers? Absolutely. I think that even seasoned developers can sometimes get lost in the ambiguity of this term. Mm 
Mox is an overarching term that includes mox, stubs, dummies, and fakes. When we define these things, it makes it a lot easier to streamline your testing. A lot of this is missed when people are teaching unit testing. They teach mocks are everything, and that can be confusing to new students as well. So this is important to clear it up for new and seasoned enterprise developers. Hmm. So how are fakes different? Fakes are a little more complex. Uh, they're similar to stubs, except for their dynamic implementations of the API. So let's take a look at this method. It's place order. If it's verified and we have a delivery date, we're going to use local storage to cache the user's cart. That way, if they come back and it's not verified, but their token is valid, we can get the cart from local storage. We want to be able to use local storage in this method because it's heavily integrated. But we also don't want to have the full working implementation because it's a lot of overhead, and we're not trying to unit test if local storage works. Mm -hmm. We're trying to unit test if place order works. Mm -hmm. In this case, we would fake out the parts of the API that we need, which is set item and get item. Mm -hmm. We don't need any other methods from the API because this is all that we're using in our method. Mm -hmm. We would add that to our Jest setup file. Here we have a fake, and it's defined globally in our Jest config. That way, whenever we interact with local storage, we're using the same implementation when our code runs and when our test runs for every unit test. You can see here we have get item and set item that do similar things that local storage would do. It just adds those items to an object, and we can retrieve them later. Now when we go over to our unit test, we actually don't have to change anything. We just use local storage like we would in our normal function because it's mocked out by the global Jest config. This is nice because when we go into our unit test, we don't have to use any different methods. We can use local storage as we would in a regular app, and it's also defined across our entire test bed. So we don't have to remock it. We can just use the same implementation in every test that we use it. So this seems like it can get pretty complex. Is there any way to avoid using these tools when unit testing? Yeah, it definitely can get complicated, Anthony. I think. An important takeaway from this is that when you have side effects in your code, it complicates everything. Um, and that's a big win for functional programming concepts. When you use functional programming, you don't really have as much overhead because you're taking in a single input and returning a single output. So I know I've heard of these things referred to as mocks, but what is actually a mock? That's a great question. Uh, yeah, it is confusing since all of these kind of ride under the umbrella of mocks. Um, but an actual mock is similar to a stub, but it's interactive, meaning we don't expect a value to be returned. It's less concerned with state, but it's more concerned with the order of execution, what functions were called, and if they were called with any specific parameters. So if we take a look at place order, we check if it's verified, and we check the delivery date, and then we call this service to actually place the grocery order. Now, we want to test that that place order function is called with the correct cart and the correct delivery date for verification purposes. In order to do that, we need a mock to find out if this function is getting called the way we want it to. So when we go into the test, we describe place order and we use what's called a jest spy. A spy is just like it sounds. We're watching the function to see what happens. We can spy on my service and we can see that it's placing the order with these correct parameters. And then we can certify that the spy has been called with those parameters. So you can see a true mock has nothing to do with local state or return value. It just has to do with the order of function calls. This is all great information. Uh, do you have any advice on when is the best time to use these particular strategies? Yeah, it can definitely be difficult, especially when you first learn it, just reaching in the tool bag and getting the tool you need. Definitely easier said than done. Um, so I created this unit testing decision tree. And you can download it after the video. And basically, it just asks you some initial questions as you go through your unit testing to figure out what tools you need. And the great part is you don't have to have a test to go through the decision tree. You just need your function. And then from the decision tree, you can go grab the tools you need and write your tests. So you start off, and you can ask yourself, does your test have a dependency, or is it a pure function? If it's a pure function, great, you're done. You don't need any of the tools I mentioned. But if it's an impure function, it has dependencies or side effects, then you can go through these other questions. 
Is it never used and only needed to satisfy the API? Well, in that case, you can just use a dummy. Pass that to fill the parameter list. Does it rely on an external infrastructure with dynamic values? Kind of like our local storage, that means you need to use a fake. And if it's not that, if you know you need a specific value from it, and you can predict that value, then you just need a stub, because it's a canned answer to the question you're asking. If it's not that, you can ask yourself, do you need a specific function or action to execute? If that's the answer, you're going to use a mock, which is concerned with what functions are called. And if you go through this whole list and you can't find any of those, you might need to go back to the first question and try again. <laughs> awesome. That pretty much covers the nuances between dummies, fakes, mocks, and stubs. When to identify them in your functions and how to implement them in your unit tests. Hudson, thanks for your time and insight. If you have any additional questions, we're always here to help. Just reach out to us through Brebug.com.